It's always such a pleasure to be on the program with Susan. I fall in love with her all over again when I hear her speak. Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. All right, I love to hear that. It's a pleasure and wonder, wonderful to be with you today. I've uh, entitled my brief remarks this morning, Three Questions, and I will talk about three questions that the Lord asks Adam and Cain after they sin and then apply these questions to us. I pray that the Spirit will be with us to carry the words that I have to say into your hearts that will help us on our journey home. First, let me just say something about questions and questioning. There's this idea that's very old, and it comes especially from Greek philosophy, that the mark of a man is a question, meaning that humans are distinguished by their unique capacity to ask questions. We're the only species capable of formulating abstract questions. Questioning sets us apart. It makes our lives distinctly human. Through asking questions, we understand our world, and through answering them, we master it. Questions enable us human progress, and they can be important ways um, important ways that, uh, that we can uh, measure our, uh, our ability to ask in, uh, new and better questions. That's one way we progress. Uh, and we answer those questions, whether they're timely or timeless questions. So questioning is important. I hope and trust that your university education has helped you learn to ask uh, questions and answer questions, important questions. This is actually one of the most important things you can learn in college or in life, to learn how to ask clear, coherent, significant questions, puts you in the company of wise men and women of all ages who, like Socrates, devoted their lives to asking questions. Such questions enable discovery and an intellectually well-examined life. Such questions open the door to one of humanity's most exciting and enduring quests, the quest to understand. So I'm a big fan of learning to ask questions. There is another, perhaps even older, idea about questions that we don't often think about. This one comes down to us not so much from Athens but from Jerusalem, not so much from philosophers but from prophets. And it is that humans are distinguished by their ability not just to question, but to be questioned. From this point of view, human life gains its true dignity and meaning as we respond to questions that ask us not just what we know, but who we are. God and His prophets call upon us to answer some questions not with words, but with our lives. Such questions deepen and dignify human life. They enable us to live a spiritually well-examined life, a life of response. The scriptures are replete with such probing personal spiritual questions. Let me just give a, a few examples of the questions I have in mind. From Joshua, who is on the Lord's side? From God to Job, wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? From Jesus to his disciples, whom say ye that I am? Or will ye also go away? From Alma, have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? And if so, can you feel so now? Can you feel the weight of those questions? Potentially such questions as these are profoundly transformative. These are the kinds of questions that can keep you up all night. They are the kind that seem aimed not merely at our minds, like the quiz questions that you may be answering in the next hour or so. They are aimed at our very souls. Such questions come from the very depths of our conscience. They come from God, and they speak to our hearts in quiet and penetrating ways through the voice of the Spirit. Today I want to talk about three such divine questions that the Lord puts to His errant children in the beginning of the world. By these questions, the Lord calls them, and by extension all of us, into account. He calls them back to Him. He calls them back to ourselves, back to our true home. So the first question I want to consider today with you is, Adam. Where art thou? 
The Lord asked this question of his newly fallen Adam, but it applies to all his children who stray. The question echoes from Eden down through the ages to each of us today. Now substitute your own name for Adam's. John, Susan, Bruce, Alinda, substitute your name. Where art thou? The Lord always wants to know where we are spiritually. And on his map of mortality, our location is always plotted against the true north of, of heaven. We are either near or far from the Lord. Some biblical commentators have fussed about why God should ask such a question as, Adam, where art thou? After all, doesn't he know? Surely an omniscient God knows where Adam is and what Adam has done. Likewise, he knows this about all of us, and indeed at all times. He knows this where we are better than we ourselves know. And yet he still asks Adam and all of us, where art thou? Why? Because the Lord's question is not really for the Lord, but for us. The question, where art thou, enables Adam to give an account for his actions. It calls him out of his hiding place, inviting him back into God's presence as a responsible moral agent. It does the same for each of us. Such a question calls us out of our hiding places and invites us into moral accountability before God. God's question also reestablishes a broken, a personal relationship that has been broken by sin. I like the very human way that the question is recast by the poet John Milton in Paradise Lost, which is about the fall. Milton's God says to Adam, where art thou, Adam? I miss thee here. This sounds very much like the question of a loving parent to a child who is strayed, a parent far less concerned with where the child is than why he would suddenly flee a formerly close and intimate relationship. Milton's phrasing makes us hear in God's question the way a father is reaching out in love to restore a broken relationship. Adam and Eve think they can hide from God and cover their transgression with some paltry fig leaves, but no forest is so thick, no fig leaves so broad or carefully wo woven as to hide sinners from God's all-seeing eye. Likewise, his voice sounds in every ear, and his question echoes in our hearts, where art thou? It seeks, us, it seeks out Adam and every errant child, where art thou? The Lord expects us to answer this question not only with our mouths, but with our lives, by turning and returning to him. So when you hear the question, where art thou? And if you're like me, you'll hear it often in your lives, on your homeward journey, especially when you stray from the path. Be prepared to respond the way that prophets often respond in the scriptures. Lord, here am I, meaning I am ready. I am willing. Take my life. Help me fix it, for my life is yours. Now a second question from the Pearl of Great Price provides another version of the Lord's question to fallen Adam. In the Pearl of Great Price, it recasts this in a very instructive way. In the book of Moses, we read, And I, the Lord God, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where goest thou? Here's a question not just for Adam, but for the ages. This, is inspired, this inspired formulation gets at an issue of even greater concern to the Lord than where Adam is or where any of his children are. Our Father in heaven is surely more interested in where we are going than where we are. In heaven's eyes, brothers and sisters, direction is more important than location. The sinner who is moving toward God is in fact closer to heaven than the lapsed saint who is moving away from God. The one is on his way into the kingdom and the other is on his way out. There is rejoicing in heaven over the repentant sinner, no matter how low he has fallen. And there's weeping over the saint uh, who is beginning to backslide, no matter how high he has risen. So a new convert whose heart is burning with desire to keep her covenants may be actually closer to salvation 
than a high priest whose testimony is waxing cold. One who is standing still, or one who is standing still spiritually. In our journey back to heaven, there really is no standing still, for life is in motion. We are all always moving toward a final judgment. And so in this journey, we are either learning or growing and becoming more prepared to meet our Maker, or we are forgetting and losing ground. Therefore, the Lord asks each of us, where goest thou? Again, substitute your own name for Adam's. Where goest thou? Once again, we must answer this such a question with our lives. As soon as we turn to him, as soon as we turn to him, we are moving in the right direction. We may be in the same spot in the road, but now it becomes not a road to Damascus, but a road to Jerusalem. It becomes the road to discipleship. Now, a third question. The third question from Genesis that I want to focus on today, which echoes down to us today, was given not to Adam, but to Cain. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is thy brother? The Lord puts the same question to all of us. He holds us accountable not simply for our lives before God. He holds us accountable for how we treat his children, who are in fact our brothers and sisters. Cain denies his fraternity with Abel by claiming to have no responsibility for his brother, not even to know where his brother is, although he's just murdered him. The Lord expects much more of Cain and much more of each of us. He expects us to know and to love our neighbor for they are, in fact, our brothers and sisters. They are, in fact, our family. So he calls to each of us, where is thy brother? This question echoes in my soul, as I hope it does in yours. It calls me to remember those in my care, my family, my colleagues, my students, my neighbors, those to whom I am assigned to minister, I seem to hear the Lord saying often to me, John, where is your brother? I cannot shrug off my responsibility to love others as Cain did with a cynical dodge. Am I my brother's keeper? For the voice of the Spirit insists, yes. Yes, you are. Know you not that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God? And when we minister to the least of our brothers and sisters, we minister unto the master ourselves, himself. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, and especially you students, I encourage you to learn to ask questions. I personally am a very strong advocate for an education that teaches students not just what to know, but how to discover knowledge. Learning to ask and answer questions is a high order intellectual ability that will enable lifelong learning and enrich your life in so many ways. But I am an even greater advocate for learning how to hear and to hearken to the Lord's questions. This is a high order spiritual ability and it's essential to our eternal life. So pay attention to the Lord's questions, whether they come from his own voice or from the voice of his servants. And I especially commend to you the three questions we've discussed today that were given in the very beginning. For they invite us to keep the two great commandments. And over time, I'm getting more and more persuaded that if I can just make my life answer to these two commandments, I will be doing well. The Lord's question, where art thou and where goest thou, holds us accountable to that first great commandment, to love God with our whole heart, might, mind, and strength. This question posed to Adam speaks to our relationship with God. The question, where is thy brother, holds us accountable for the second great commandment. It speaks to our relationship with our neighbors. From the very beginning, the Lord has been calling his children to fulfill these two grand imperatives on which hang all the law and the prophets. 
Brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, he calls us still through such questions as these to love him with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. May we respond to these questions, to the Lord's questions. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.